Uh, many thanks, Lillian, and to your panel. Uh, we're just coming up to lunchtime, but before we do that, uh, as many of you will probably be aware, there was another conference uh, hosted by GCF going on uh, this week too, in fact, in this very room. Uh, the Global Programming Conference, which was all about gathering GCS partners to look at uh, harmonizing strategies and informing the, the funds programming. So uh, the feeling was it would be useful for people attending GPIC too to just gain a little bit more insight into that. And of course, how that relates to the, the private sector. And so I'd like to invite to the stage, please, um, Carolina Fuentes. She's the, the director of the Division of Country Programming at GCF. And Carolina is here to tell us a bit more about the GPC and how that relates to all of us in this room. So Carolina, over, over to you. Thank you so much, Scott, and uh, thank you also uh, participants to the Global Private Investment Conference. It is an honor for us also to address you uh, here after the uh, GPC has concluded. And I will have the pleasure and the honor to communicate some of the key takeaways uh, from the Global Programming Conference uh, that just ended uh, yesterday. Uh, for that, I have the pleasure of being uh, joined uh, by Keith and Nichols, Head of Program Development and Management Unit of the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center, five C's as, as we know it, and also by my colleague Calle Casado, who is the Regional Manager for Latin America at the GCF. They were, were part as well, same as uh, several of you of the Global Programming Conference, and will be sharing some of the key aspects that emanated from there that also relate and pertain uh, to the work of the Programming Investment Conference. So we hope that you find it uh, useful. This is a short uh, session. And of course, we don't have any plans to interfere uh, with your lunch. So we'll keep it uh, crisp and to the point, but we hope that you find it uh, useful. The GPC, and just in terms of the uh, participation, the GPC uh, brought together over 400 participants. And as part of this, uh, more than 40 high-level representatives. It was possible as well uh, to engage in different uh, settings, including uh, plenary sessions that took place in this, in this very room and also in some uh, side rooms uh, around the venue. Also bilateral meetings and ministerial uh, events uh, took place. And very importantly, also we had a marketplace where uh, we brought together accredited entities, uh, delivery partners, countries and GCF experts, so we could help as well in uh, putting together proposals that can uh, inform climate action, ambitious and bold uh, climate action. The conference was structured around uh, three key themes. Day one uh, was uh, in relation and, and address partnerships for climate ambition. And this was important also to chart uh, the path for GCF on the way forward. I will provide some key takeaways on day one. Day two address building blocks for effective and impactful climate investment. This was a day dedicated to programming and my colleague e. Calle Casado will be also providing some of the key uh, takeaways and lessons uh, from, this, uh, from this day. Last but not least, uh, we had day three that took place yesterday, navigating access, how to make the most of GCF support and my colleague Keith Nichols it will be speaking also of some of the important uh, lessons and takeaways that came out out of uh, day three. Now, when it comes to partnerships for climate ambition, uh, one of the key uh, also cross-cutting aspects of both uh, GPC and JPIC is the fact uh, that GCF is a partnership organization and the two events were made by our partners. It is all of you the ones that made up uh, these conferences, and also the ones that inform and provide uh, the basis for the ongoing work of the GCF, you as part of the GCF, but also for uh, the institutional journey of GCF on the way forward. And in that context, uh, day one was dedicated as well to listen to our partners when it comes to your feedback in the context of the updated strategic plan for GCF2, that is the second replenishment period of the GCF that will go from 2023 to 2020, my apologies, from 2024 to 2027, and also to inform some other strategic documents, such as the readiness strategy that is currently under revision and that will be presented to the board in March 
2023. So it was very important uh, to hear from you on how to shape the way of the GCF on the way forward, and we gained important feedback. When it comes uh, to the updated strategic plan, uh, we heard uh, from you as well a strong confirmation on the willingness to program more and to program at greater speed. But also it was important uh, to hear that it is not only about funding volume, it is also about enhancing the quality of that uh, funding. And as part of that, uh, there was a strong request also to strengthen the role of GCF when it comes to adaptation, direct taxes, participation of the private sector, and also enhancing country ownership and alignment to the country's strategic priorities. We take that with us as some of the important feedback uh, to feed into the USP. We also heard that uh, it is important for GCF to uh, break new ground with regards to access, and this is access in all its dimensions, including speed, simplicity, harmonization, direct access and volume, as mentioned also by the executive director. And this resonated in several of the sessions of the GPC. So this is one of the aspects uh, also that we take uh, with us that will inform the updated strategic plan. Another aspect that this conference are making clear is that uh, we need as well to meet with our partners, not only in the context of the GPC and JPIC, but we need to be closer to you. In several occasions, there were notes about the need and the importance of regional uh, presence, and uh, also how this can have a positive impact in building relationships and facilitating access. This is something, uh, the fact that there is a need and requirement for GCF regional presence that we're taking to our board to inform the conversations on the matter. We also receive feedback on our revised aid readiness strategy to guide the next stage of what is the largest uh, capacity building program for climate change uh, globally. On this, uh, there was a strong request to simplify the review of readiness proposals and to reduce the overall review timelines. We also need uh, heard on the need to move faster towards multi annual uh, readiness, making it simpler, having less processes and allowing longer term uh, planning. Feedback was also provided on the need to consider a dedicated window for supporting direct access entities, and also with regards to the need of revisiting the annual allocation cap. So these are some of the aspects that we're taking with us as it comes to the revision of the readiness program. There was also an important emphasis uh, given on the need uh, to um, look at readiness as a means to an end, but not as an end in itself, because readiness needs to create the capacities and the basis for something uh, bigger. So there is a need for us to question ourselves what comes next when the support of readiness is provided and implemented by countries, and also to support that next stage. Readiness, of course, is not a prerequisite for a full funding proposal, but if readiness is used, we need to look at the next stage. So also that is something that we need to, to strengthen on the way forward. Those are some of the aspects covered on, on day one. And with that, I would like uh, to move ahead uh, to day two and to ask my colleague, Kaye, to please provide us with some of the takeaways of this day. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Carolina. Um, so day two was dedicated to, to effective and efficient investment. And, uh, and we had a, a series of discussions on integrated resilience planning, a lot of sectoral discussions, um, as well as dedicated discussions for private sector and direct access entities. Um, I think one overall message that came out of the discussions uh, on, on Wednesday was the need for GCF to align to the Paris Agreement architecture. GCF is serving the Paris Agreement, but GCF was created before the Paris Agreement existed, and uh, some of its uh, processes and cycles have their own momentum. So we now have a, uh, a clear architecture uh, with the Paris Agreement, uh, cycles of NDCs, long-term strategies, and enhanced transparency framework. Um, so a, a general call was for the GCF to be more responsive to, to those cycles. And that, of course, it relates as well to uh, 
developing investment planning for NDC implementation. Um, the Paris Agreement will require um, to identify and to implement transformational paradigm shift in mitigation and adaptation projects. So that's in turn going to require unprecedented amounts of capital, most of which needs to come from the private sector. Um, countries have identified in their NDCs, in their long-term strategies, in their NAPs, priorities that are increasingly clearer as there's more information available and more exercises, more robust uh, done around the, the NDCs. And so this is already setting a pathway for uh, for where those where should this investment be focusing on, and what policy uh, changes need to happen in order to trigger uh, uh, market development for for several of these of these sectors. So when it came to what role GCF GCF should have in this cycle, um, the first uh, message was that GCF GCF should be supporting countries in building an evidence based approach to identify investment options. That is, the investment planning needs to be based on emission scenarios, on climate risk and vulnerability assessments as a, as a first step. And then through other criteria, of course, uh, cost efficiency, co-benefits, equity, uh, et cetera, a priority of uh, areas for investment uh, would be identified. So the GCF through its readiness windows through its project preparation facility can actually support this analytic work to uh, underpin the investment options. Um, and we did, did in fact cover this earlier, er, early morning Wednesday, talking about integrated resilience uh, interventions, um, and then <clears throat> continuing in the in the in in the investment uh, pipeline uh, identification, then. GCF should also reorient its country programming tool. We we have country programs where uh, there is some analytic work that um, informs the pipeline of projects that will be worked with GCF in a certain cycle. Uh, and the call here was to um, not repeat what is already there. And as I said earlier, the NDCs already have the priorities very clear, but move forward. So that is identify costing needs to achieve those priorities, what uh, different sources of financing are most are more appropriate for the different uh, priorities? What type of instruments are more appropriate? Uh, are we talking about uh, sovereign uh, debt? Are we talking about uh, uh, carbon markets, etc.? Where does it make most sense to apply one instrument or the other? Um, and and then GCF should be supporting also this type of analysis through its country programming uh, programming process. And again, readiness is a window of financing that can be used to, um, to, to develop these investment plans for NDC. This is, of course, an exercise that is going to benefit the country as a whole. But we also expect that from this exercise, we will have a clear idea of the funding, um, the funding ideas that countries want to work with the GCF. And related to this, there was a call to make the different tools and windows of GCF more coherent and fluid with each other, and perhaps one triggering the other. So if we start with this uh, investment planning, uh, identifying uh, windows of opportunity for GCF, then this should be triggering um, the project development technical assistance for developing concept node, which in turn would trigger the project preparation facility for funding proposal development and move towards the project cycle much more smoothly and rather than than uh, somewhat isolated areas. And then, um, as I mentioned, we had a lot of sectoral sessions. We had sessions on ecosystems, energy, transportation, water, agriculture, forest, and climate information, where the uh, issues of innovation, scalability, sustainability were, or were touched upon, uh, what paradigm shift means for each of these sectors. We presented some tools in some of the sectors that the uh, sectoral guidance that have been developed by the GCF to guide project development. And of course, the topic of private sector, as you can expect, came out consistently throughout the session. And, uh, and, uh, and then again, the role of GCL as a catalyzer of financing was, uh, was mentioned extensively and of GCF to work together with accredited entities to establish co-investment platforms for critical transition areas. Um, 
And then finally, we have a uh, session on, on private sector dedicated exclusively to working with private sector, which is uh, a sort of prelude to this conference. Uh, and I think there were two key messages here. One is that readiness is a powerful tool also for private sector. It's been so far mostly dedicated to private sector. GCF Secretariat is, is doing an increasingly better job in mainstreaming private sector, but there should also be readiness ex focused exclusively on private sector and on, on removing these barriers for, uh, for markets to run smoothly and solve the, the, the climate change issues. Um, and the second, uh, the second uh, message from this session is that, again, it's something GCF is already doing, but should be done uh, more in, in, in a more um, profound way, which is uh, opening windows for private sector investment in the adaptation field, in the mitigation. The, the, the market rules are clear, the benefits are clear, but when it comes to adaptation and depending on the sector and the circumstances, there are much many more market flows. So GCF should be focusing on trying to tackle uh, those flaws and uh, and uh, foster uh, climate finance investment in, in, in those areas. So I'll, I'll stop here, Carolina, for a bit. Thank you, Calle, for providing also uh, some of the key aspects that were addressed in session uh, two, in the day two and the sessions uh, that were in the GPC uh, program, in particular, also how this uh, connect uh, to private sector and some of the aspects also being discussed in the context of JPIC. On that note, uh, we move as well to day three, uh, that, that also is closely connected as well to the matter of programming and is making emphasis on access. And on this respect, uh, also how to make good use of uh, GCF support was addressed, including when it comes to implementation, lessons learned, and how that uh, needs to set a knowledge base for us to move forward. Many thanks, Keith, also for providing us with some of your uh, views and perspectives on the outcomes from day uh, three. Thanks, Carolina. It's um, a pleasure for 5 cs to be able to support this discussion and to be here as well. Um, I think given the fact that we've seen improvements in the relationship between the NDAs in the Caribbean and the GCF in recent times, it speaks volumes to, to the attention that the GCF has paid to the concerns that have been expressed over time and certainly were articulated yesterday in D3. And it, it's a recurring theme actually in uh, throughout the entire GPC itself. Uh, one of the key takeaways is that the GCF has worked very concertedly to addressing the barriers of communication, access to, to, to funds, access to information, to support to expertise within the GCF to reduce those barriers, to create more efficiencies in decision-making. Um, these, these were concerns that continue to be expressed by member states, but we've seen the transformation. The transformation is good. And I think when member states left here yesterday or today, they, there was the impression that, hey, you guys are listening to us and our concerns are heard. They're being addressed. We've seen the changes being made. Uh, we see the modalities for access and climate finance being eased a bit. And we know there's quite a bit of work that still has to be done. But we are getting there. It's an evolution process, but all the elements of progressive change and positive transformation is there. The willingness to listen, the willingness to change instruments, to shorten the decision-making time. I, I think, like I said, there are still some transformations that would need to be pursued but uh, we're pro pro progressing in the right direction. So that's an important component. The, the offer of or the role of the independent units, in, the independent evaluation unit, the independent integri integrity unit, and the independent address mechanism, and the offer of additional support, enhanced support to the countries, I think will go a long way towards in, ensuring that the quality of outputs is delivered. And now we're seeing a more engaging approach between the independent units. They're no longer um, esoteric functions of the GCF or uh, outside of the GCF, but now integral components of, of the work and the support provided to countries, NDAs and, and countries in, in delivering on, on programs and projects. So that is encouraging. And the, 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 the emphasis on engaging with countries throughout the implementation process is a very, very positive one from the, the, the emphasis of the independent units. And even this, this, this morning, the, the echo of 
continuous improvements to mechanisms to support decision making, to facilitate access, to working with countries, that's ongoing. And it, it, I think it speaks, as I said earlier, volumes to, to the, the attention that the GCF is paying to the real concerns expressed by the countries from the Caribbean. And we've always said that each region has its own specific nuances. And we have to take those into consideration where we provide the support to make decisions for support. I wish to revisit a bit um, the, the issue of private sector engagement. And one of the things that came out in the discussions of private sector is that you can't paint the private sector of all the regions with one paintbrush. They're different. They, they, the mediums, the micro, small, and medium enterprises in the Caribbean, for example, tend to be fairly risk averse. So for whatever reason that is, possibly historically, there needs to be greater emphasis placed on how do we engage the private sector, get them to understand what it is we need to do, what their role should be, defining those roles and clearly articulating what it is they can gain from that process and what we can bring to the table. There also is the issue of creating the enabling environment. And this is something we have to work towards. But this is essentially a public sector construct, creating the policies um, and, and uh, putting in place the fiscal instruments, incentives to enable private sector engagement is key in all of this. The need to, to working with the financial institutions in the region, the support that can be provided by development banks for one, the support that can be provided by, by um, credit unions, insurance agencies, we need to work with them because they are part of the equation. And secondly and thirdly, we can't assume that the private sector is on board with everything that needs to be done. There has to be um, some knowledge sharing, get them to understand what it is we're dealing with, what they need to do, what support can be provided, and how can the GCF working together with, with ND, uh, direct access entities, as five Cs and the NDs as well, to ensure meaningful collaboration to, that would allow the transformation of their engagement um, in greening their own businesses. So with that, in, in, I would like to stop it for now with these remarks. Thank you. M many thanks, uh, Keith, also for uh, those uh, rich uh, points uh, from the discussions on day uh, three that certainly help us uh, look at the conversations and at the feedback that was provided during that intense day uh, in the light of the sense of progression uh, that we have as, as we move ahead in, in the journey of GCF. And it's good also to see uh, that there is uh, that sense of uh, listening to our partners and to our stakeholders, but also taking a stock of the feedback that is received and uh, feeding that into the evolution of GCF as an organization. So many thanks for those uh, reflections and also for touching on the private sector. With that, uh, I would like to check if there are any questions uh, from the audience. I see that we don't have questions in the WOBA app, but if there is any question uh, right here, we have we have some uh, minutes for that. Uh, there is a question here in the back. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I'm asking about uh, for, for, for our presentation. For our insight, the engagement of private sector in the climate action is very challenging to us in the developing countries and especially in LDCs. Because, uh, you know, the private sector cannot be easily convinced to enter this uh, challenging uh, uh, funding for climate change activities, both mitigation and adaptation. So we need more orientation and sensitization to private sector to be engaged wholly in this uh, process. Thank you and so much. Many, many thanks for addressing that important matter on uh, the need of climate finance in LDCs and the engagement of the private sector. I invite some views as well from our panelists here, uh, Keith uh, Calle on work in LDCs and private sector. Thank you. I, and I totally agree with with comment as well. I think the the nature of engagement with the private sector has to be upscaled uh, to one because the NDC is a reflection of where the public sector sees the direction of the country. Private sector is normally left out of that equation, both the NDCs and 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 of course 
Um, it's always felt that adaptation is a responsibility of the private sector. But we need to have a stronger orientation um, with the private sector to secure the engagement. And um, obviously, that speaks volumes of um, how we can secure the type of progress we need to make in building resilience. But then there's a lot of work that still needs to be done with engaged in private sector. So the orientation, I think, is key, a key element in that regard. That, that is right, the orientation and the signals uh, that are sent, the market signals uh, that can, of course, uh, foster the engagement of the private sector. Kaya, I wonder if perhaps in relation to the readiness and, and private sector engagement, uh, you mentioned that as well, if there is anything also that can help uh, unlock a greater private sector participation in, in LDCs and in developing countries in general. Thanks. Um, yeah, perhaps uh, as, a, uh, as a starting point, um, at least in the Latin American region, we see um, uh, when we look at the NDC processes or long-term strategy processes, we are we are seeing that the private sector not not every country is the same, of course, but uh, we're seeing that private sector is involved in the conversations earlier in the in the cycle, and and it's it's considered it's being considered a key partner in order to determine what is feasible for a country to do vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the the Paris Agreement, and uh, and the readiness uh, window is is a window that, as I as I was mentioning earlier, can support uh, all the NDC development processes and and beyond, and it's such a flexible window that can be tailored to to uh, to really um, whatever um, element needs strengthening in 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 each particular country and making sure that the private sector is a voice in the NDC process and making sure there's consultations that there is uh, uh, information gathering behind it that uh, that there's analysis of market barriers etc it's something that can be supported and funded by by readiness and that can in turn inform the NDC planning and the NDC investment cycle Many, many thanks, uh, Kaye, and thank you, uh, Kido, also for those reflections. Mindful of time, uh, and also that uh, lunch is waiting for you all outside the, the room. Uh, just to mention as well that uh, we really hope on the side of the GCF that you have found uh, the Global Programming Conference also a, a good investment of your time. We know that all of you came uh, from uh, very long distances as well, and uh, in most of cases you had to adjust to a different time zone, etc., in order to be with us here. So we really appreciate your time, and we uh, trust that this uh, has helped you as well in terms of making progress in climate action. Uh, that is a common mandate that we have in our organizations, and also we as GCF, we want to uh, reaffirm uh, the contribution that we make as a, as a hub and as a convener of uh, the climate finance architecture. You are uh, that architecture. So it is, uh, of, of course, uh, uh, very uh, gratifying uh, for us and very significant uh, to have you here joining the uh, Global Programming Conference and the Global Private Investment uh, Conference. Uh, also, uh, we uh, would like to thank you for being part of the institutional journey of uh, GCF. Uh, we are uh, moving ahead towards the second replenishment cycle, also building on the inputs and the contributions that you have made. And we ask you for your continued uh, support as we move forward towards uh, GCF2. That is the second replenishment period, 2024-2027. At the end of the day, the world of GCF experience resides with you, countries, and also our partners. Many thanks for being a, a part of this uh, journey together and for sharing that experience with us during the GPC and JPIC. Thank you all and have a, a good lunch. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Kaya. Thank you, everyone.